Shalom brothers and sisters. It's been a little while since I've done a video, but out of sight certainly hasn't meant out of mind. And in the background, I've been doing quite a lot of studying on eschatology, especially the second exodus, which I believe is shortly about to take place. Now, the second exodus, if you don't know what that entails of, I would encourage you to watch my first video. Uh, I'll leave the link in the description. And that was titled, Are You Ready for the Greater Exodus? Or Are You Waiting for the Pre-Tribulation Rapture? Now, in this video, I go into more detail about what the second exodus is, um, when it takes place on the timeline, and why there is confusion between this event and a rapture event, which is a future event. As well as this, they're both future events, but there is some confusion um, because certain doctrine has been added into the body of Messiah in order to try and confuse um, Yah's children and those that will follow Yah um, into believing something that is not um, biblical. So because of this, I believe it is important for us to have an understanding of what the second exodus is when it shall take place on the timeline. And if we understand that, it helps us to understand what the exodus entails of and how it will come about um, and that is important so if you have a look at that video again i'll leave the link in the description it will help bring us some clarity and understanding in this video what we're going to look at is some amazing revelation about the timing of the second exodus according to scripture uh, i don't believe it's hidden but i do believe it's written in a way that yah's children who are in the know of his appointed times will have that understanding and if we have that understanding it enables us to be prepared and to be ready for this event rather than to be caught unawares or caught by surprise because this is something that is ordained to happen now many people um in christianity inverted commas will tell you that this has already happened and it happened in 1948 in that political state they call israel that however to Yah's children, his true seed, that to, however is a lie. We know that that has not happened and Yah has not regathered his seed, his true seed that have been scattered all throughout the four corners of the earth. But he has promised in many scriptures, some of which we will look at in brief detail later on and which you can find in more detail in my previous video linked in the description. But we will find that there are many scriptures that show that these events that Yah has promised have not yet taken place and since Yah is not a liar and cannot lie we know that they have to take place and if we are watching the signs and the seasons that of the times that we're in we will know that that time is soon upon us so in this video we're going to look at the timings of that event and although things are in Yah's control and under his power and he's the one who knows the exact timings he has given us the information for us to know so we can be ready and be prepared for the times and seasons that these events are going to take place. So I want to start by looking at um, a few principles of what Yah is, which is our Alawah in the heavens, and he has done whatsoever he pleases, that we find in Psalms chapter 115 and 3. He dwells in the heavens, and he has done whatsoever he pleases. And the reason why that's important, as it confirms in Psalm 135 and 5, that I know that Yah is great and that our Alawah is above all Alawahs. Whatsoever Yah has pleased, that he has done in the heavens and in the earth and in the seas and in all deep places. Now, this is important for us to know because Yah is perfect in all his ways. His will is good, acceptable and perfect, as it says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And therefore, we know that Yah, being perfect in all his ways, can do whatsoever he pleases and whatsoever he pleases will always be good. Now, that is important for us to understand, remember and keep within ourselves because we know that Yah can choose to do things that he sees fit and whatever he sees fit is always good. That being said, we also know that Yah said in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9 that the thing that has been is that which shall be 
and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Here Yah is saying that what has been done in the past is what shall be done in the future. There is no new thing under the sun. There is no new event that is going to happen that hasn't already happened. Now that doesn't mean that everything will happen in the exact same way. That's not what he's saying. But what he is telling us is that if something has happened in the future, there shall be a repetition of it in the in in the um, if something's happened in the past, sorry, there shall be a repetition of it in the future. And that is so critical and key for us to understand when we are looking at eschatology, because many of the events that have happened previously are mirrored in the latter days. They are many of the things that happen in the beginning, even if you just look in the book of Genesis, chapters one and chapter two, and then you look in the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and 22, you see many parallels and that is literally at the start and at the end so this is the principle that Yah operates with and it is is order to give us understanding knowledge and for us to be in the know of when things are going to happen that's why he operates like that so that his children who are studying his words who have studied the word of the past and the present will also know the word of the future it's a very important principle that I must stress on. And that is why when we read our scriptures, we have to look at the whole scripture, not just the scripture that people say is the new covenant or the new Testament. Uh, the old Testament or the old covenant is equally as important. And if you don't understand and get the things of the past, you will not get the things of the future. It is one book. It is man that has split it into various books and various um chapters and verses and so on but it is one book which is contained by multiple books and I don't just stop at the 66 canonized books there are also many books that were removed as we well know and has been covered in other videos as well as many books that were added which were actually not part of Yah's word and that is um, from the evil one who is sowed his own seed to try and confuse Yah's people but if you're operating with the Ruach HaKodesh the Holy Spirit then you will be able to decipher what books are of Yah and what ones are not. And he will lead you into all truth and bring all things to your remembrance, as his glorious son told us. So it's important for us to know these things and to remember the principles that Yah operates on. Yes, he can do whatsoever he pleases. We don't put him into a box that he can only do a certain thing or he's limited to certain thing. He can do whatever he pleases because his will is good, acceptable and perfect. But he also operates with principles of that which is done in the past shall be that which shall be done in the future. So bearing that in mind, let us have a look at the first Exodus and Passover, which we can find in Exodus chapter 12. And I'm going to read through chapter 12 just so we get some understanding and context of what the first exodus uh, is and Yah spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying this month shall be unto you the beginning of months it shall be the first month of the year unto you speak ye unto the congregation of Yasharel saying in the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers a lamb for a house and if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male lamb in the first year, and ye shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Yasharel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it upon the two side posts of the upper door, post of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. 
And thus ye shall eat with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste, it is Yah's Passover. Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the Alawahs of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am Yah. So here we see the pattern of the first Exodus and some various dates and appointed times. These were instructions given to be followed to the letter. They were not random instructions. They were given on appointed dates and appointed times. And this is how Yah operates. He operates with accuracy. So let's see the summary or the conclusion of that first Exodus, the first physical Exodus and Passover. That the lamb was chosen on the 10th day of the first biblical month. It was inspected, observed and examined between the 10th day until the 14th day of the first biblical month and it had to be a young lamb without blemish. The lamb was killed and prepared on the evening of the 14th day of the first biblical month just before sunset. The lamb was eaten as the Passover meal at night after sunset which made it the 15th day of the first biblical month also known as the first day of unleavened bread. So this was the pattern of the first exodus and the dates that the various tasks were to be performed. And as it says in Ecclesiastes 1 and 9, the thing that hath been done is the thing that shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. So knowing this pattern of the first exodus and what took place when, we need to bear that in mind when we're looking for the next exodus, which is the second exodus of a spiritual proportion that we're going to look at that many people don't see but we need to see this in order for us to see the future so let's look at the second exodus and second passover which was the true exodus and true passover in a spiritual form and that was by none other than our messiah yahweh hamashiach because he was the one who exodus us in a spiritual way and he was the one that sacrifice himself at Passover in a physical and spiritual way for our benefit so let's look at this because many people don't really see this but this is the true Passover and the true exodus in a spiritual form now if you put the gospels in chronological order uh, of Matthew Mark Luke and John you will see that in verse 1 of chapter 21 in Matthew where it says and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives then sent Yahushua two disciples you will see that this particular event took place on the 10th day of the 40 of the first biblical month now the reason why that's important is because it mirrors the first exodus that on the 10th day of the first biblical month, the lamb was chosen and was inspected between the first, the first four days, from the 10th day to the 14th day. And here we see that on the 10th day of the first biblical month, that Yahushua entered Jerusalem being the true lamb of Yah. And what was going to happen to him? He was going to be examined for those four days, just like in the first Exodus. So let's look at some of where he was examined, some of what happened, so we can see that it is an examination because we are looking for a lamb without blemish. Now, in Matthew 21, dropping down to verse 23, we see the beginning of his examination. And it reads, And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, by what authority dost thou do these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Yahushua answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned with themselves saying, 
if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did you not believe him? But if we say of men, we fear the people for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Yahushua and said, we cannot tell. And he said unto them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. So we see here that this was the beginning of Yahushua's examination, his examination of what his uh, status was. Was he the lamb of Yah without blemish? We see that they began to examine him. And this was only the beginning. This was the first mention when he entered Jerusalem. Bear in mind, this is when he entered on the 10th day of the first biblical month. They began to try and find fault with him. So let's continue to see other examples of this. <clears throat> in chapter 22 of Matthew, in verse 15, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in talk. And they sent unto them their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of Yah in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Yahushua perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny or a denarii. And he said unto them, Who is the image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto Yah the things which are Yah's. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So here we see the Pharisees coming to Yahushua, trying to trap him, trying to catch him out. And he answered with wisdom, knowledge and understanding. And they marveled. Then on the same day, in verse 23, came unto him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, dropping down to 31. So the Sadducees then asked him a question, trying to catch him out. Again, he answered with wisdom, knowledge and understanding, which we see in verse 31. But as touching to the resurrection of the dead, ye have not read, which was spoken unto you by Yah, saying, I am the Alawa of Abraham and the Alawa of Isaac and the Alawa of Jacob. Yah is not the Alawa of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence and they were gathered together. And then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And then you see a dialogue between Yahushua and this Pharisee. And dropping down to 46, at the end of the dialogue, it said, And no man was able to answer him a word neither darest any man from that day forth ask him any more questions <coughs> excuse me so here we see Yahushua entering Jerusalem on the 10th day of the first biblical month and he was examined by various people the scribes the Sadducees and the Pharisees first it was a scribe who examined him then it was a Pharisee who examined him then the Sadducee came and examined him and he answered them all with wisdom, knowledge and understanding. And when the other Pharisee heard that he had silenced the other Pharisees, the Sadducee and the scribes, he also came to examine Messiah. And again, Messiah answered him with wisdom, knowledge and understanding. At the end of it, it says that no one dared to ask him any more questions and they were astonished at his doctrine. So we see that during this period, between the 10th day leading up to the 14th day, which we're about to see, Yahushua was examined and questioned and they tried to entangle him and catch him. And no fault was found with him, just as in the first Passover with the first literal lamb that was observed between the 10th day and the 14th day of the first biblical month. No blemish was found in that lamb. We know that no blemish was found in our Messiah. Let us continue. Now, we know that eventually they conjured up lies and arrested Messiah on false pretenses 
and then they wanted him delivered unto Pilate for him to be crucified. So let's look at Luke chapter 23 and verse 4, where Pilate said unto the chief priests and the people, I find no fault in this man. Pilate has examined him and he finds no fault in him. Now, obviously, this is now on the 14th day of the first biblical month because he was crucified on the 14th day of the first biblical month, which is the Passover. So Pilate examines him and finds no fault in him. And we know, according to the chronological order of the Gospels, that Messiah was then sent over to Herod and Herod examined him and sent him back to Pilate. And this is what we see when we drop down to verse 13. Yosha has now returned to Pilate and this is what Pilate says. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverts the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. So we see that Messiah was declared innocent by Pilate. He was declared innocent by Herod since he sent him back to Pilate. And that tells us that our lamb was without blemish. He was a spotless lamb examined between the 10th day of the first biblical month when he entered Jerusalem all the way up to the 14th day of the first biblical month when he was killed unlawfully. He was a righteous man. And that shows us that he, being the true lamb of Yah, was without blemish. That is so important for us to understand because that is the basis of what our salvation is built upon. So we know what the first conclusion of the first physical exodus and Passover is. And now let's conclude what is the first spiritual exodus and the true Passover. It's a spiritual exodus and true Passover because what it represents. And I will cover that a bit later on in the presentation. Messiah entered Jerusalem on the 10th day of the first biblical month. He was examined from the 10th day until the 14th day of the first biblical month by the Pharisees, Sadducees, Pilate and Herod. And no fault was found in him. He therefore qualified to be the true Passover lamb without blemish. He was hung on the tree at the third hour, which was 9 a.m., and died at the ninth hour, which was 3 p.m. He was then taken down from the tree and put in the tomb just before sunset that evening on the 14th day of the first biblical month. And the Yehudians or the Jews ate their Passover meal at night after sunset, which made it the 15th day of the first biblical month, which was the first day of unleavened bread. So here we see a literal perfect mirror of the first Passover with the physical and literal lamb in Moses's day. Here we see Messiah fulfilled all the criteria of the first Passover on the exact dates at the exact times. And when he was examined and found without blemish, he qualified to be Yah's Passover lamb, the true Passover lamb. And that was a physical Passover for us and a spiritual Passover for us and Exodus and we're going to see that later on as to why that is classed as a spiritual Passover and Exodus it was the true Passover the Passover we saw in Exodus chapter 12 was just a shadow of what was to come in the future that Messiah fulfilled so now we have an understanding of the first physical Passover and Exodus and the first spiritual passover and exodus the true spiritual passover and we'll see why it's an exodus um a bit later on now we're going to look at some of the verses that show us of a future passover and exodus which will be a physical literal passover and physical literal exodus as well as spiritual representation now, I'm not going to cover this in too much detail because, as I said in a previous video, I've gone through all these uh, scriptures. Um, so I will leave the link in the description. But to understand the second 
physical exodus, which is to take place in the future, in the very near future, we can look at Isaiah chapter 11. And I'll just read from verse 11 where it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Most High shall set his hand against the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Paphros and Cush and Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Yasharel and gather together the dispersed of Yehuda from the four corners of the earth. This is a prophetic future event that has not yet taken place. And since Yah is not a liar, he will perform it at its appointed time. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 1. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith Yah. Therefore thus say, Yah, de therefore thus say Alawah of Yasharel against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away. And ye have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evils of your doing, saith Yah. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith Yah. <coughs> Excuse me. So another scripture showing a future prophetic event that will happen which is classed as the second exodus the second physical exodus and this we see again in jeremiah chapter 30 where it says for lo the days come that yah that i will bring sorry let me start that again for lo the days come saith yah that i will bring again the captivity of my people yasharel and yahuda saith Yah, and I will cause them to return to the land that I have given their fathers, and they shall possess it. Dropping down to verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So we know that Jacob or Jacob's trouble is in Daniel's 70th week, which has not yet taken place. And so this shows us that he will gather his people from Yasharel and Yehuda and cause them to return to the land that he gave to their fathers and they shall possess it. If that is happening in the time of Jacob's trouble, that day, which day? Jacob's trouble in that day, we know that that is a future event that has not yet taken place. So this 1948 doctrine of Israel being regathered and people returning to the land is just not true. But again, watch the video uh, titled, Are You Ready for the Second Exodus or Are You Waiting for the Pre-Tribulation Rapture? And you'll see where that has been exposed as a lie. Ezekiel 20 also talks about um, the second exodus. It shows us in verse 6, the previous exodus or the first exodus. In the day that I lifted my hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I aspired for them flowing with milk and honey which is the glory of all lands this was referring to the first exodus and if we drop down to ezekiel uh, chapter 20 and verse 34 it now talks about the second exodus and it says and i will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there will I plead with you face to face like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, say of Yadai Aloha, and I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant and I will purge out amongst you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the countries where they sojourn and they shall not enter into the land of Yasharel and ye shall know that I am Yah. Now this one is perfectly um, composed in terms of showing us what happened in the past, which we saw in verse 6, and then showing us what will happen in the future, which we see from verse 34 down to verse uh, 38. And 35 particularly talks about bringing Yasharel into the wilderness 
where he will plead with us face to face, just like he pleaded with our fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will he plead with us, saith Yah, thy Eloah. He will make his covenant with us and he will purge out from amongst us the rebels and those that trance against him. So we see that this is a future event that has to take place because it refers to the first one that happened and shows us that a second one will happen so this is information we need to know and need to know that it is part of eschatology it is for the future events that have not yet been fulfilled and we know that Yah will fulfill them because he is not a man that can lie or can repent from what he has said what he has said is what he will do And there are many other scriptures relating to the second exodus, but Joel chapter three also gives us some more understanding that this is a prophetic event. Uh, just reading in verse six through to nine, the children also of Yehuda and the children of Yashorilim have sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them from far from the border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters to the hands of the children of Yehuda, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for Yah have both spoken it. Proclaim this ye amongst the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. And going on to verse 12, 13, 14, 15 and 16, this talks about how there will be judgment in the valley of Jehoshaphat where those who have enslaved Yah's people will be repaid and they will be punished. And we see specifically in verse 14, it says multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of Yah is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon shall be darkened and the stars will withdraw their shining. And if we know anything about prophecy, we know that that relates to Revelation chapter 6 on the sixth seal, that the day of Yah is near in the valley of decision. So we know this is a future event because the day of Yah has not yet taken place. Yah has not poured out his wrath on the earth and to those disobedient and those who enslaved his people. These are future events that will take place. So we know the second exodus is something that has not yet been fulfilled and will be fulfilled at some point in the very near future and this is key for us to understand and recognize because then we can prepare to look out for it at the appointed time and Yah has shown us through what we've looked at that on the first exodus it was at the appropriate and appointed time just as the second spiritual exodus was, a, was at the um, appointed time we also can therefore look out for the third exodus being at the appointed time. They all mirror each other. Now, something important for us to understand is the concept of the scripture that says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall a thing be established. We have seen evidence in one sense that the past will represent the future. That the exodus that was completed on the 14th day of the first biblical month happened twice <coughs> in the past. Once the physical and literal lamb being slayed in Exodus chapter 12. Then we see our Messiah being slayed in Matthew chapter 27 and the rest of the Gospels. And they both happened at the same time. Is it unrealistic for us to believe that the second exodus will also take place? at the same time, at the appointed time. Let's have a look at some more information that will confirm this theory. Now, <clears throat> in the book of Revelation, in chapter 11 and 12, specifically chapter 12, we see the woman who is fled into the wilderness. And this woman that's fled into the wilderness is explained to be having the 12 stars on her head, which represent the 12 tribes of Yasharel. So let's look at starting from Revelation 11, because there are specific time periods that are mentioned over and over again in different ways. And we want to identify those 
to see if there is a similarity or to see why they are mentioned and what do they mean. So Revelation chapter 11 and verse 1. And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of Yah and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, and they shall tread underfoot forty and two months. Now that's the first time we see a direct correlation of a time period 42 months in verse 3 and i will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days which is a thousand two hundred and sixty days three score is sixty now a thousand two hundred and sixty days is basically 42 months if you divide um a thousand 300 260 by 30 for 30 days in a month you will get 3.5 which is three and a half years which is what 42 months is so all these time periods equate to the same time but they are mentioned in different ways 42 months and um 1260 days so we have to bear in mind that yah is accurate in what he says if he's given us two different meanings or two at that at the same time period there must be a reason why now let's move on to revelation chapter 12 and verse 6 and the woman fled into the wilderness where she shall be prepared of yah a place that shall feed her there for a thousand two hundred and three score days so here again we see the same time period mentioned as was mentioned to the two witnesses a thousand two hundred and sixty days and if we drop down to Revelation 6, uh, sorry, 12 and verse 14, it says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So again, we see another time period now mentioned, but this time period is mentioned as a time and times and half a time. And we will see later that a times time and half a time is also equivalent to 42 months or 1260 days but i'll cover that in more detail and although not part of this particular teaching um in revelation chapter 13 and verse 5 talking about the beast it says and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given him to him to continue 40 and two months so we know that this 40 and two months which is the same period as the three and a half years we've looked before in terms of duration we know that this is a separate period of 42 months or three and a half years because it says to continue you can only continue doing something if you were doing it before so this period of 42 months mirrors the previous period of 42 months, it is a separate period, same duration, but a separate period. And of course, if you add 42 months plus 42 months, you get 84 months, which is equivalent to seven years, which is Daniel's 70th week, the last week of, uh, of Daniel, which hasn't been fulfilled at the time of Jacob's trouble. So that we see is a perfect mirror of these different time frames mentioned although they are the same time frame in terms of duration i.e three and a half years they are two separate periods of three and a half years both added together making seven which is a week or seven days is a week and therefore that is daniel 70th week so i stress on this importance for us to kind of understand that what yah has done is he has showed us two periods within consecutive order, three and a half years and then another three and a half years, but has mentioned them in various ways. And that is a clue, that is an indication that he's trying to tell us something. The reason why he's mentioned them in two separate ways or three separate ways as we're about to see. So let's look at this in more detail. And the second Exodus timings, the evidence of the timings. 
Now, the outer court being trampled on by the Gentiles for 42 months, which we read in Revelation 11.2. Prophecy from the two witness for 1,260 days, which we read in 11.3 of Revelation. Woman fleeing into the wilderness for 1,260 days, Revelation 12 and 6. The woman being nourished in the wilderness for time, time and half a time in Revelation 12, 14. And if you go back to the book of Daniel in the OT, you will see that it says that the saints of the Most High will be worn out for a times, time and the dividing of time. You find that in Daniel 7 and 25. So again, we see this same language as was in Revelation 12, 14 of a time, times and the dividing of a time of half or half a time. So it's very um interesting that these different phrases are used both in the old testament and new testament it must be giving us an indication that yah is telling us something important and also in daniel chapter 12 and verse 7 it says that him who swears by him who lives forever that it shall be for a times time and a half again the same language as daniel 7 25 the same language as revelation 12 and 14 and again as we saw in revelation 13 and 5 that power will be given to the beast to continue for 42 months so a second period of 42 months because he's continuing something not starting it so all seven time periods that we've seen above equate to two separate time frames of three and a half years the question is, why are they described using three different phases, phrases being 42 months, 1,260 days, and time, time, and half, or the dividing of time? Now, time, time, and half, or the dividing of time, we know that this is a three and a half period because time equates to one year, times equates to two years which is time plus time and then half a time equates to half a year and we add them all together one year plus two years plus half a year gives us three and a half years so all these three periods are showing the same duration of time but they're described in different ways and where we get the clue the revelation the knowledge as to what Yah is referring to is when we look into the Hebrew meaning of the word time found in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 7. That the Hebrew word is the word moed, which is Strong's H4150, and this means appointed times, seasons, solemn assemblies, set times, solemn feasts. That is the moed or the moedim which is Yah's appointed times. And where do we find Yah's appointed times? We find it in Leviticus chapter 23. So let's look at Leviticus 23, starting in verse 1, where it says, And Yah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Yasharel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of Yah, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these <coughs> are my feast. Excuse me. Dropping down to verse 4. These are the feasts of Yah, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the 14th day of the first biblical month at evening is Yah's Passover. So we see that these appointed times listed in Leviticus 23, if we read through the rest of that chapter, we will see that all Yah's feasts at the appointed times are laid out. And not only are they laid out, they are laid in order. So we know what the first feast is and we see it all the way through during Yah's seasons of the appointed time of the feast days. And the first feast we see in the 14th day of the first biblical month at evening is Yah's Passover. So this is amazing knowledge now that we know that this time 
times and half a time or dividing of time is a moedim. It is a moed. It is Yah's appointed time. And Yah's appointed time, as we've seen in Leviticus 23, is starting at Passover, which we've already seen on two occasions, is on the 14th day of the first biblical month. Now, if Revelation chapter 12 talks about the woman fleeing into the wilderness and is nourished for 1260 days or nourished for a times time and half a time as it says in Revelation 12 we know that that time must start at the appointed time of Yah's first appointed feast which was Passover now as I explained time means one year times means two years which is one times plus one times and half a time means half a year which is the three and a half years <clears throat> but the three and a half years is at a specific time which is the year starts when the passover starts the period of that three and a half years starts on the first feast day at passover so we see that it goes from Passover to Passover, from one Passover all the way through to the feast season up until the next Passover counts as one period of time. And then we go from that new Passover all the way through to the Passover of the following year. That counts as another period of time, but it says times. So we have to do that twice. So we have one Passover, two Passovers, all the way up to three Passovers. And when we get through to three Passovers, it counts as three periods of times. And then it says half a time, which we know would be half a year, which will take us from Passover all the way through to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is half a year. So that perfectly adds up to be three and a half years, starting at the first feast day which is Passover on the 14th day of the first biblical month so this is important um, revelation because it means that when the woman flees into the wilderness and is nourished for this times times and half of the time we know that that therefore according to Yah's word has to be at Passover and we know that Passover is the 14th day of the first biblical month which equates to, in Babylonian time, April, when the spring season starts or when the life of the plants and everything begins to regenerate, we know that that must be the appointed time for the second exodus, if the second exodus is in line with Revelation chapter 12, when the woman flees into the wilderness. And as many people, myself included, who believe that is, it shows us that Yah's appointed time for this event has to take place at Passover on the 14th day of the first biblical month because that is the start of the Moed. That is the start of the Moed season, the Moed deems Yah's appointed times, Yah's feast days as we've seen in Leviticus 20 and 3 or Leviticus 23, I should say. So, to summarize, the first physical exodus was in Exodus chapter 12, where the lamb's blood was put on the doorposts, which allowed the angel of death to pass over the dwellings of the Yasharelites and not execute judgment of death penalty on them before they began their journey to the wilderness to escape from Pharaoh. It was a physical exodus out of the bondage of slavery from physical Egypt. And when did this happen? It happened at Passover on the 14th day of the first biblical month. Now the first spiritual exodus, which we found in Matthew 27, Luke 23, Mark 15 and John 19, when our Messiah was crucified. Now this was when the blood of the true lamb of Yah, our Messiah, was shed and enabled us and those who repent to follow his way to escape the judgment of the wages of sin brings, which is death, that is eternal death. Now, this was a spiritual exodus out of the bondage of spiritual Egypt 
which represent sin. That's why that event was classed as an exodus. We know that Messiah was the true Passover lamb, the lamb of Yah, without blemish, and he was sacrificed. And just as in the first exodus in Exodus 12 in Moshe's day, the blood was put on the doorpost so that the angel of death would pass over where he saw the blood and not kill the firstborn. Here we see that when Messiah's blood was shed, those who believe and claim that blood and follow in his way, repenting from their sins, also escape the final judgment, the death penalty that sin brings, which is the wages of sin is death. So this is a spiritual exodus because we are spiritually leaving the place of Egypt, which is sin, and coming out of it into the promised land, which is eternal life. This is why that is classed as a spiritual exodus, the true exodus that Messiah performed by his death, burial and resurrection. And when did it happen? It happened at Passover on the 14th day of the first biblical month. Now, the second physical and spiritual exodus, which we have looked at the scriptures in Jeremiah 30, Isaiah 11, Ezekiel 20, Joel chapter 3. This is a prophetic event, a future event, as we have seen. And this is Yah's promise to regather his people who are the true Yasharelites from wherever they have been scattered all over the world, as well as those who recognize his true people and have the spiritual blood of the true Lamb of Yah. And this is to escape Yah's coming judgment that will be poured out to the nations that enslaved Yah's people, as well as the persecution from the lawless one, aka the man of sin. This will be a second physical and spiritual exodus physical because like the first exodus we will be moving from babylon into the wilderness into yah's set aside place so that makes it uh, physical <coughs> excuse me but it is also spiritual because we will be leaving physical bondage that this babylonian system enslaves us in and moving into yah's place of nourishment which is a spiritual nourishment as well as physical because the woman is nourished for 1260 days so this physical and spiritual exodus is something that will happen it will come to pass and when will that be according to biblical evidence it shows that it will be on passover on the 14th day of the first biblical month, just like the previous exoduses and Passovers. What is done in the past will be done in the future. There is no new thing under the sun that have that have been is that which shall be. And because of all of this, we also understand and know that Yah's appointed times, which starts with Passover, according to Leviticus 23, is when he performs his exoduses so this is when the second exodus will take place now of course we don't know when that will be in terms of which year will it be in 2023 or in 2024 or beyond but we have to be wise the scripture says that we must be wise as serpents as, as harmless as doves we have to use the information that we are given to decipher when that will be now messiah said something that is important for our day but he said it back obviously in his day to that generation there and i'll paraphrase what he says because i can't remember it verbatim but it's something along the lines of when you look at the sky and see that it is clear you say it will be a clear and nice day and you are correct and when you look at the sky and see that it's cloudy you say it's not going to be a good day and you are also correct he said but you're hypocrites because you can see what the weather is and predict it accurately but you can't see the signs of the times in other words what he's saying is that the times and the signs are amongst you in terms of the the seasons that you're living in and it is written it corresponds with his word but yet you don't know what times you're in there should be no reason for us not to know the times we're in if we're studying his word because we are seeing his word come to pass it is being fulfilled and everything that is going on and that is happening is in our scriptures and now it may not be written in there verbatim because Yah's scriptures work by the Ruach HaKodesh. 
he writes them in a way that the inspired writing gives us the basis but it's the holy spirit the Ruach HaKodesh that gives us the understanding and that's the one that reveals all truths and brings things we have read to our remembrance that's how Yah works we need a relationship with him in order to get to that stage it's not just reading the scriptures and interpreting it with our own brain it's the Ruach HaKodesh that gives us this knowledge and understanding and that is the same way we will know when the time is upon us but we now know the season so every time we approach that season the beginning of the moed the moedim we should be on our guard we should be looking at the signs of the times and knowing that yah will fulfill his word at the appropriate and appointed time as he always has does he says what he means and he means what he says now if yah be willing i'm going to do a part two to this particular uh, teaching and that will cover another doctrine which ties in with the second exodus and that is the three days of darkness now there are many uh, different sects especially the catholics that have this as a doctrine within their scriptures and this is uh, additional things they have added to the bible that they go by in fact I believe in one of their statements it says that they have the higher authority of the bible so they've added these scriptures to their their book whatever they use and one of those doctrines is that there will be a free day of darkness upon the whole world now many believers in messiah don't believe in the three days of darkness because when they look in the canonized bible they don't necessarily see it saying a three days of darkness there is a scripture that refers to uh, darkness upon the land which we'll cover in part two you be willing but um, it doesn't specify that it will be three days and because of this and because it is a catholic doctrine there are many people that throw that out and say that cannot be true as a friend of mine says they throw the baby out with the bath water we must not do that we must rightly divide the word of truth and we must study to show ourselves approved because that is the way we will know what is true and what isn't. So in part two, if you are be willing, I will go over some revelation that I believe the Rak HaKadosh has given me with regards to the three days of darkness. And whether that is a true doctrine or whether that is a fallacy made up by Catholics and others. And we have to bear the principle in mind. Ecclesiastes 1 and 9. That the thing which hath been is the thing that shall be. That which is done is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. No pun intended. So we have to see whether or not that these things that happened in the past, which we know did happen in the book of Exodus, there was three days of darkness. It wasn't over the whole world. It was over Mitzrayim or Egypt when they held captive um, the Yasharelites. And when Pharaoh refused to let them go, in fact, I believe it was the ninth plague out of the ten plagues that were given. It was like a warning and many people died during that period. And then after that period, the tenth plague, which was the execution of judgment on the firstborn that we already read in Exodus 12. We see that this three days of darkness did happen before. And we know that what happened before will happen in the future. So we should already be querying that. There could be some truth to this, but let's not be foolish by throwing everything out because other uh, faiths that we may not believe in may have and have it as part of their doctrine. Let's not say, well, it can't be true because we have to study and show ourselves approved. And by Yah's grace, in part two, we will be looking at the three days of darkness and some more timings with regards to revelation so that we can have a better understanding of things that may be coming to pass i'll leave it right here may Yah bless and keep you may he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and may he lift his countenance upon you and may he give you shalom hallelujah